a mostly down week for the precious metals complex. The silver spot price closed the week at roughly 17.50 fiat fed notes per troy ounce. That's down around 50 cents on the week. Gold spot price ran uh, down about $20 an ounce, closing right below 1,500 fiat fed notes per troy ounce. The spot platinum price finished a little bit down for the week, right around the $933 per troy ounce mark, while palladium hit a new nominal price high to end the week, closing around $1,685 fiat dollars per troy ounce. A building story we've yet to discuss on this metals and markets wrap this week. We dive into details and questions surrounding why is the Federal Reserve now injecting over 100 billion fiat Federal Reserve notes on a daily basis into the overnight lending facility. We'll be right back with more after this message from our show's sponsor. SD Bullion is a high volume, physical precious metals dealer here in the USA. If you are acquiring an investment grade bullion position, be sure to bookmark www.sdbullion.com forward slash deals, where each and every week we source some of the best bullion deals for our over 100,000 customers worldwide. At the bottom right section of our website, you can also easily subscribe to our weekly bullion deals mailing list, where you will receive weekly notifications of valuable product deals that may be exclusive only to our SD Bullion mailing list. Stay tuned to sdbullion.com, the lowest price, period. Welcome to this week's Metals and Markets Wrap. I'm your host, James Anderson of SD Bullion. This week, we'll have no guests on the show. Rather, we're going to dive into the details and questions surrounding what the Federal Reserve is up to in the repo markets. On Tuesday, September 17, 2019, the private central bank of the USA, the Federal Reserve, stepped into financial markets to keep short-term interest rates from rising. This is the first time the central bank has had to carry out uh, transactions like this market operations since the global financial crisis. U.S. currency markets effectively experienced a bank run as oversized demand for repurchase agreements, also known in short as repos, whose rates spiked overnight to an unprecedented high of over 10%. Here are a few questions onlookers might be asking themselves. Why are we seeing the Fed do repo operations for the first time since 2008? Why is demand for overnight cash still being oversubscribed even after the Federal Reserve almost doubled the initial market intervention amount? If one of the key arguments for having a central bank is to be lender of last resort, why is the Fed having to pump over 100 billion fiat Fed notes per day into the financial system? Are they the last resort? The excuse that was initially given that some last minute corporate tax payments jacked up overnight bank lending rates, that's not a real driver here. Common sense knows we've not seen anything like this in over a decade of time. Every corporation's accounting and finance department knows when their taxes are due. The truth is we're probably not going to find out what's really happening until it's probably too late for most people. Let's look at some potential reasons though behind how and why this might be happening. As the U.S. Treasury increasingly continues to issue more bonds and shorter-term notes it has not collected enough taxes to fund, also known as deficit spending, the increase in IOUs issued with varying time frames are supposed to be sold to primary dealers. A primary dealer is a financial bank or institution that buys government securities directly from a government with the intention of reselling them to others, thus acting as a market maker for U.S. government IOUs. So, having a look at the chart, Why have U.S. primary dealers been increasingly hoarding treasuries over the last year to two? Is it simply that we have an oversupply of U.S. treasuries currently and a lack of reserves to fund dealers' purchases of new treasuries? Have we just simply had too many of these IOUs to cover, especially given QT? There must be an underlying constraint, a reason yet disclosed, as to why primary dealer banks are not fulfilling their roles as lenders and market makers. In terms of sheer size and volume, This, on a reported per-day basis, this could be the biggest bailout in financial plumbing history. When are we going to find out at least the real reasons for why this is happening? As I've done on this podcast before, uh, I want to take you to a website called Wall Street on Parade and see what they're writing about uh, as far as this story. 
The article is entitled, The Fed is Offering $100 Billion a Day in Emergency Loans to Unnamed Banks, and Congress is Not Curious Enough to Hold a Hearing. It's written by Pam Martins and Russ Martins. The Federal Reserve Bank of New York first initiated its emergency overnight loans to Wall Street this year on Tuesday, September 17th, starting off at the rate of $75 billion daily. It then increased its loans by adding, in addition to the $75 billion daily, 14-day term loans in the amount of $30 billion to be offered three times this past week. But after the demand for the first 14-day loan was more than double the $30 billion offered, the New York Fed boosted the next term loans to $60 billion and increased its overnight loans to $100 billion. What will next week bring? When Wall Street can get super cheap loans from the Fed in the tens of billions of dollars with no questions asked by Congress, it will continue upping its demands until the Fed is once again secretly shelling out trillions of dollars while Congress willfully remains in the dark. In other words, a replay of the 2007 to 2010 financial crisis. The New York Fed is only allowed to engage in these repo transactions with its 24 primary dealers. The list of 24 primary dealers includes the securities units of big U.S. banks like J.P. Morgan Chase, Citibank, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, and it also includes U.S. banked securities units of troubled foreign banks like Deutsche Bank, Credit Suisse, and Societe Generale, otherwise known as SOCGEN. Because the New York Fed is not announcing which banks are drawing down the bulk of its loans, Neither Congress nor the American people know if the money is flowing to U.S. banks or foreign bank subsidiaries in the U.S. Propping up troubled foreign banks is not what most Americans want their central bank to be doing. If the New York Fed is secretly funneling money to a unit of Deutsche Bank to prop it up, the American people need to know about it, and Congress needs to be asking questions. The Fed already got away with this during the last financial crisis, secretly funneling $77 billion to Deutsche and the term auction facility TAF. $1 billion from the primary dealer credit facility and a whopping $277 billion to Deutsche Bank for the term securities lending facility for a grand total of $354 billion in secret funding that Congress never approved or even knew about. It's only when the Government Accountability Office released its one-time audit of the Fed in 2011 where Americans made aware of the unprecedented loans the Fed had made to Wall Street banks and their foreign derivative counterparty banks, which tallied up to $16 trillion in cumulative revolving loans. But the GAO's report was $13 trillion short of the full amount the Fed funneled in banking support through additional programs the GOA did not report. When those programs are added, the figure is $29 trillion, according to the Levy Economics Institute's analysis. Deutsche Bank is a likely candidate to be having funding problems. Its attempt to merge with Commerce Bank fell through in April. Its latest plan to fire 18,000 workers and create a good bank slash bad bank, isolating off unwanted assets that it plans to sell. Deutsche Bank has run through four different CEOs in the past four years and incurred losses in three of those years. Its share price has lost 90% of its value over the last dozen years, and it is trading close to historic lows as of yesterday. On Monday, it reported that its prime broker unit that makes loans to head funds was moving over to BNB Paribas, along with its electronic trading operations. Unfortunately for U.S. investors, Congress has taken no action to rein in the seismic risks of derivatives held by those behemoth global banks. Deutsche Bank is heavily interconnected via derivatives to U.S. banks, including J.P. Morgan Chase, Citibank, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, and Bank of America. If it blows up, it has the potential to spread the kind of systematic contagion that Lehman Brothers spread in 2008, seizing up lending between banks because no one knows who has exposure. Credit Suisse, another primary dealer, also having difficulties with its share price, losing 70% of its value since 2007. Sakjen has also had a bad decade since the crash, with its share price losing 66% of its value. According to the report out this morning from the New York Fed, demand for its emergency loans has quieted down some this morning. Of the $100 billion it offered out to its primary dealers for a three-calendar day loan to cover this weekend, only $22.7 billion in bids were submitted for the loans. Of the $60 billion it offered out in 14-day term loans, banks only bid $49 billion. That's a big change from this past Tuesday when the New York Fed offered $30 billion in 14-day term loans and banks asked to buy or bid $62 billion. Wall Street and Parade is not the only financial news outlet that thinks there's something much bigger than a technical seasonal funding problem happening on Wall Street. John Dizzard wrote this yesterday at the Financial Times. In recent days, some banks and dealers have wound up paying hundreds of basis points over the Fed Fund's target rate for the short-term money. 
The implication to money market people is there are big unknown counterparty risks out there and nobody wants to get caught in another layman workout. Simple math tells you something is very wrong. As we had previously written, as of June 30th of this year, the four largest banks on Wall Street, which are allowed to own federally insured commercial banks as well as stock, bond, and derivative gambling casinos known as investment banks, they held collectively more than $5.45 trillion in deposits. The breakdown is as follows. J.P. Morgan Chase holds $1.6 trillion, Bank of America has $1.44 trillion, Wells Fargo has $1.35 trillion, and Citibank is home to just over $1 trillion. The entire GDP for the United States last year was $20.5 trillion. The four banks mentioned above have 27% of the entire U.S. GDP in deposits. How could it be possible that those four banks can't come up with $100 billion in repo loans per day, and thus are forcing the Fed to once again become the lender of last resort? Congress needs to call hearings on this matter immediately, calling as witness the President of the New York Fed and the CEOs of each of the mega banks holding these trillions in deposits. There are already trial balloons out there in the mainstream financial media uh, basically saying that the Federal Reserve's portfolio of security should expand to $315 billion over the next two quarters. Uh, and then they as well should, should put in a standing fixed rate repo facility basically a bridge loan concept, a kind of QE on demand, you know, as, as whenever you want QE, just come on by and get it. The Fed may just have to simply skip all this and just invent some new QE program using a new name. The St. Louis Federal Reserve Branch publishes charts and shows the Federal Reserve Branch's balance sheet has been expanding over the last month of time. What you see here is the Federal Reserve's balance sheet this century, leading into the 2008 financial crisis then the TARP and subsequent three quantitative easing programs peaking into late 2017. The balance sheet was just below $4.5 trillion. The drop in the slope on the right is the QT or quantitative tightening program that we've you know, just went through over the last year, year and a half. Uh, program's done and it only dropped the balance sheet around $700 billion. Now, if you look to the far right, we can see again that the Federal Reserve is expanding its balance sheet. As we focus in, we can see almost $100 billion have been added in less than 30 days' time to their balance sheet. At that pace, the quantitative tightening effort that we heard all so much about, that will be erased by April of next year, 2020. Turning back to the Fed's repo loan madness story, that's supposed to come to some sort of fixed solution by October 10th next month, regardless of whatever is causing the Fed to have to offer over $100 billion a night to smooth over night lending rate spikes, the Fed still has major headwinds to deal with. The fact is, the median U.S. citizen does not have much wealth, and we live in a democracy that is politically charged and as divisive as ever. The largest swath of our population is retiring at a clip of 10,000 workers per day, and neither they in the aggregate, nor the federal government, nor the unfunded pension funds and the uh, liabilities that have been promised, they have not saved enough for the decade to come and beyond. Whatever they decide to call QE4 and QE5, the Japanization of our supposed capitalistic financial system is here and further is coming to fruition. The issue is the effect. When you look back at QE1, QE2, and then QE3, each subsequent intervention and financial market cash injection has had dissipating, less worthwhile results. The Federal Reserve is likely to end up more than doubling its current balance sheet by the year 2030. The question is going to be at what cost the fiat currency and at what cost the value of financial assets they are attempting to prop up and at what cost to the average U.S. citizen at large. Keep your eyes on this story in the month to come. And that is all for this week. You all have a great one out there and thank you for listening.